You'll have to forgive my voice this morning. I'll do the best I can. Have your Bibles turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. We've talked about this morning, but Genesis chapter 2 records the story of the Akedah, as it's called in the Jewish tradition. It's the story of Abraham being called by the Lord to take his one child of promise, Isaac, and to go to a destination that the Lord would choose. And so the two of them head out with some servants, and they load up the donkeys and mules and start heading that direction for three days that they journey together and finally they get to a location and the Lord reveals to Abraham this is where I want it to take place they allow the servants to stay back and the two of them journey on and Abraham goes and, and gathers stones and forms an altar he starts arranging the wood and then he binds the hands of his son Isaac and lays them on top of the altar And just as the knife is being drawn, tragedy is averted. The Lord intervenes and an angel stops the path of the knife being plunged into his son. The Hebrew writer highlights this encounter as proof of Abraham's great faith. But I have to tell you, over the centuries, this story has been uh, problematic for some people. In fact, it's, it's a very complex story. And just taken on its own, Man, why in the world would the Lord allow this to take place? Why would he ask his chosen servant to do this? Why would he ask a, a father to take the life of his son? It seems so barbaric. It seems like something that the pagan nations would do, but yet the Lord commands this. Well, I, I don't think it's fair for us to look at it within a vacuum, but rather within the greater context of what's happening with this ongoing faith story with Abraham. I think it's important for us to look within context to see what God's been up to. And if we agree to that, I think there are two questions that we still have to answer. The first of which is, why would the Lord ask him to do this? Why would the Lord test his faith? And if you think about it, when he's called back in Genesis chapter 12, if you want to back up to there, he's called a faithful man. He believed in God. He was a good man. And that's why the Lord chose him to be the father of this great nation. And when called, he was obedient. He packed up everything and says, let's go. Where are we going? I don't know, but the Lord's going to direct us. I have faith in him that he will take care of us. And finally, he was sold out. He understood what a lot of people struggle with, which is understanding God's worldview. Understanding it's not just about me and that my fame is going to be blessed and going to be a great nation. But in turn, that nation is going to be used to connect with other nations. That my will is going to be taking place through you and your people. Abraham understood this. He's a man that walked by faith. It appears to me he was all in. But even if you rationalize that, well, but it's still good for the Lord to test him, why in the world would he choose and and feel compelled to test Abraham at this point in his life? If you think about it, Abraham, at the time that Isaac was born, was how old? 100 years old. And at the time of Sarah's death, at the end of this story, he's 137 years old. So my best guess is at the time of this testing, Abraham is between 110, probably 120, and 137, somewhere in that window. Why would he choose to ask this senior servant, why would he test him in the twilight of his life Why try his faith now? Well, I believe that this was a test of trust. He's asking him, you know what, I'm going to tell you something that doesn't make sense to you. Are you willing to yield to me when everything around you tells you not to? And by by the way, this was a test, this test of trust that Abraham had not passed up until this point. Are you sure, preacher? I mean, isn't he called the father of faith? Let's look at a few examples. In Genesis chapter 12, when he's called, guess what? Yes, they're faithful and they're obedient and they head over to the promised land. And so it says the Lord directed their steps. The Lord guided them around. They went from east to west, north to south, saw the whole thing. The Lord is there. The Lord has brought them there. He's walked them through. They even build an altar and worship the Lord there in the promised land. But as they're looking around, they're also seeing the promised land as they arrive in the midst of a famine. So what they do? Well, they didn't have to do anything. 
You know why? Because they're there with the Lord. The Lord is in their midst. He's right there with them. Two years ago, I had the opportunity to go trout fishing with some of the men for this congregation on the Little Red River up in Arkansas. And when we arrived, we started walking down the bank of the river. We're going to be fishing. We figured out that it was not the best day for fishing because no one was catching anything as we talked with them on the sides of the bank. And it had been raining all week long, so the lake up above was too full. So the Corps of Engineers had been draining water all week, which had just made the river bottom real muddy, and apparently the trout don't like that. And so we're walking down, and it's like, man, I haven't caught anything, I haven't caught anything, until the seven of us hopped into the river, and we threw out our lines. And guess what? Isn't that an awesome picture? We, we started popping left and right. Here goes Jeff Dowdy would pull one out. Then Robin Bridges' line would, would go. Then Dave Egley's reeling one in. And then you got the Barneys, Dan and Adam, downstream. They're just killing it. And so we're popping left and right. People on either side of us are going, what in the world's going on? Two groups actually put down their poles and came and talked with us and said, what are you guys doing? And we tried to convince them it was our superior angling skills. But in reality, it had nothing to do with that. In reality, it was our guide, Jeff Smith, was the owner, is the owner of Leland Lures. He's also the inventor of a little thing called the trout magnet, which happens to be the number one selling uh, trout lure in the United States. He created it, he's developed it, he's built a company around it, and he's our guide. So we kind of knew what we were doing because he's right there with us. But you know what? That's the way Abraham should have viewed things, shouldn't he? He's got the Lord right there. We're not going to worry about this. But it said, then Abraham left and went to Egypt to go seek help during this famine in search of food. And he's not done making his own way. See, Abraham has another problem. It's not just that they're hungry. He's also married to a knockout, as they say. Apparently, Sarah was a very attractive woman. He's fearful. As we go into Egypt, people are going to notice you. And guess what? They may want to kill me to be with you. And so he says, do me a favor. As we go in, tell people, just kind of lie a little bit, and tell people you are my sister. Technically, it was true as um, they had a common father. It was his half-sister. But how beautiful was she? I think she was the second most beautiful woman to ever walk the face of the earth next to my wife, Jill. But sure enough, they they walk in and heads start turning in Egypt. And Pharaoh adds this 65-year-old woman into his harem. She's coming in and there are all these young girls. Wow, okay. Can we call you Mama Sarah? Sure. You know, so she comes in at 65 years old. 24 years later, at 89, same thing happens. And King Abimelech, Uh, It turns his head as well, and he asks Sarah to come be a bride as well. Praise be the Lord that he interceded on behalf of Sarah before these kings could sin and and alleviate this situation. Well, what was Abraham's reasoning behind this? King, King Abimelech asked him, why did you put me through this? Genesis chapter 20 and verse 11 says this. I said to myself, there's surely no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. What he's saying here is, you don't know my heavenly father. And because you don't know my heavenly father, you don't know how much power he has. You don't know how he's in control of the situation. You don't know how good he is, and therefore you can't be fearful of my heavenly father. But here's the deal. If Abraham feared God, if Abraham knew how powerful the Lord was, is there any reason in the world why he should fear those kings? No, the only one that showed a lack of faith in God was Abraham. Flip over to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, God promised Abraham a child from his body. Abraham's concerned because he's been here in the promised land for a while. He's already filled out his will. He's like, well, Lord, I've got my will done, and uh, so far... I don't have anyone to pass it on. So I'm like, well, my favorite servant's this guy named Eliezer of Damascus. He's like, no, no, no. It's not going to be Eliezer of Damascus. It's going to be a child of yours from your body. And they waited for a decade, 10 years, 
nothing. And so Sarah was way beyond the childbearing years. And so sure enough, guess what happens? They finally had gotten to the point where they said, we can't wait on the Lord any longer. So instead of waiting on God's time, Sarah asked Abraham to lie with her, with Hagar, Egyptian servant, and to conceive an heir through her. You know, I'm sure it sounded like a great idea at the time. How did that turn out? It turned out into a cat fight. Well, you couldn't see that one coming. You know, but you got this horrible situation where Sarah has has devised this, and then it blows up for poor Abraham. And guess what? Before it's all said and done, Hagar and her infant child Ishmael flee for their lives and go out to the desert just waiting to die. And the Lord met him there and said, I'm going to take care of you. You know, just a little aside, is there any other way for you to blow up your life quicker than stepping outside of God's will sexually? I, I don't know that there is. But for Abraham and Sarah, essentially what they're saying is, God, we know what you've promised. We, we know what your plan is. We're just going to tweak it a little bit. We're, we're just going to adjust things a little bit. And God says, no, that's not what I had in mind. Turn with me to Genesis 17. A couple pages over. In Genesis 17, 14 years later, Abraham's now 89, 99, excuse me, and the promised child had yet to arrive. Uh, you know, but by this time, I imagine he's done with the plan. He's like, God, if this was going to happen, it would have happened long before that. I wonder if he's starting to question his faith in God altogether. But in this chapter, God returns to Abraham and he tells him, it's finally time for the child to come. Now it's interesting when you're reading through this text in the Hebrew, because up to this time, the whole story of Abraham, every episode that I've talked to up to this point, when God presents himself to Abraham, he uses the name El Yon, the Most High God. He's like, there's other gods around that you can worship. I'm the next tier. I'm higher than any other God the Most High God. But this time, when his faith is down, when he's questioning, Lord, can you even do this? He presents himself to his servant Abraham as El Shaddai, God Almighty, the God who's able to fulfill his promises. I think it's interesting that the Hebrew word for Shaddai is also from the same root word for breast, Shaddim. It's the same name that God will use later in the story where you have Israel. Jacob is sitting around with his sons and he brings them forward one by one. He gets to Joseph and he says, I want to give you a special blessing from El Shaddai. Genesis 49 verse 25 says, blessings of the breast in the womb. May you be fruitful. May your life be fulfilled. May everything that you have, blessings from the breast in the womb. That's how he presents himself. He's like, I am the God that can do this. And the time has come. You've been faithful. You've waited. Let's move forward. It's going to happen. How would you react to this? You know, I would imagine he'd get down his knees and like, yes, I want to offer up praise. He got down, but since he got down on his face, and he laughed. How do you laugh at God and survive? I mean, if I'm the Lord, I'm like, man, I brought you in this world. I can take you out. But he's also thinking, really? You think this is too difficult for me? I can scoop up dirt and make Adam. And while he's napping, pull out a rib and make Eve. And you think I can't drop a child of promise into an old womb. You do not know that how I can do this. I am God Almighty. Genesis 17 and verse 17 said he just fell down and he laughed. But after Abraham composes himself, even more troubling to me than the laughter comes the next verse, Genesis 17 and verse 18. If only Ishmael would live under your blessing. God, I know you've got this in your your mind what you want to do. I, I know that we've got this whole many nations thing that's got to be accomplished, but take my son Ishmael. Let's do it through him. Uh, let's not worry about this child that you're talking about. Let's do it through Ishmael. I wonder so many times if the Lord looks at us 
in our lives and says, man, you've got a lot of Ishmael's. Yeah, but Lord, can you work through those? Because it seems to work better for me. This is the path I've chosen. It may not be the path we see here, but just kind of do the best you can with my Ishmael's. That's not what the Lord had in mind. It seems that Abraham is more consumed with the method than he is with the mission that God has. But the Lord blesses him with the child in spite of his short-sightedness. So we return to Mount Moriah, Genesis chapter 22. Hopefully we understand kind of this larger concept. But we need to understand what's foundational to this story because there's this notion of promise threatened. This is what we need to get in our mind. We have an idea in our mind as to what life is supposed to be like. As children, we play house. My daughter gets Barbies when she was younger and does things with mommy Barbie and daddy Barbie and children and all these different things. We play roles and we think about what life is going to be like. And sometimes when we have in our mind something that's not what God has in mind, all too often we want to hold on to that. And when life doesn't turn out like we want to, sometimes we want to grab the reins from God. And God says, oh, I've got so much more in charge for you. I'm sorry. That's not what I intended for my life. That's not what I intended for the life of my child. And so we try to wrestle things back from God. And that's what's going on in the context of this story with Abraham. Repeatedly, God has laid out his plan. And when timing didn't happen, and when things threatened, Abraham said, I've got to protect what I have in my mind. Because it came from God. He gave me the vision. And so he wrestles things back. And God says, we're not going to do that anymore. I've got to put you through one final test where there are no other options. This is exactly what I want you to do. Will you trust me? Will you yield to me? How's the story play out? The Lord stops Abraham from hurting his young son Isaac. He allows a ram to be caught in the thicket. You know the story. To serve as a sacrifice. And on that mountaintop, a third name of God is proclaimed in this story. Abraham buckles at the knees and he says, Jehovah Jireh. I finally get it. The Lord will provide. And he finally sees... Up at this point, it's been me. I've been the one that's been grabbing a hold of this. I've been the one that's been using my resources, not leaning on you. I'm trying to do it on my own accord. It has to be the Lord who provides in this. What's in it for us? How does this story help us? I mentioned last week that those that make a faith commitment in the Lord, sometimes we'll, we'll go into a period where like, Okay, now that I've been baptized, I'm becoming a Christian. I now got to get, get involved with faith-based activities. I've got to study my, my Bible. I've got to read, and, and I've got to pray, and I've got to go to Bible class and get involved in ministry, and all these things are great. Sometimes, after a period of time, you go through some of these repetitive, and you're not experiencing completely the life that we see, the life of joy and love that's described in Scripture. Many times we go through a time we become discontent. And I talked last week, that's not all bad. Sometimes God allows us to go through this period of discontent, but he doesn't want us to stay there. He wants that to drive us somewhere. He wants to drive us to a place where we're broken, where we'll stop and take a look at things. God meets us like Abraham head on, and and he reminds us that we're too self-reliant. He reminds us about the sin that's still prevalent in our lives. And he's like, I've got so much more in in the store for you if you'll only allow yourself to be broken. And so he tells us about repentance. What we need to realize is that God wants to get to our heart. And God wants us to change our relationship with him. But we have to realize that all sin in our life and all uh, paths off from God's path are, are, are foundational to one thing and that's our self salvation project we're trying to do it ourselves we want to have God as kind of a consultant that comes and helps us where we're going to do some different things here and there but I'm still maintaining my life and God says how's that working 
I've got so much more in, in store for you if you'll only release yourself and realize that good deeds and, and more morality and, and through achieving things is not going to get you where I want you to be. I can only imagine those three days where Abraham is journeying up on the mountain. Three days is a long time to think over his life. Think over the journey where God has led him and how he's grown a lot, but he also realizes God's testing me for a reason. God wants me to be broken, and if taking your son up to sacrifice him doesn't break you, I don't know what. But he doesn't want us to be just broken up because that will lead us to where he ultimately wants us to be. He wants us to surrender. He wants a radical dependence upon him to finally get to the point where you yell uncle and just say, I can't do it, God. And the Lord's going, yes, I know. I've been waiting for you to say that. To develop the maturity and connection desired, we have to get to that point. What does God want us to do? He wants us to move beyond religious deeds to a consciousness of being with him. To wake up every morning to begin the conversation. To talk with God and say, God, I want to abide with you today. I want to connect with you. I want you to guide my life because looking back over the past few years, I haven't been doing a real good job of my own power. Oh, Lord, if I'm going to be effective, the days are evil. I've got to have you guiding that process. So we humble ourselves before God and accept his guidance to lead us. What was the result after Abraham got to this point of personal brokenness and surrender? James chapter 2 and verse 23 says, From this point forward, Abraham was known as God's friend. Well, that's what I want. <laughs> For us to get there this morning, which name of God do you need to trust most? Ellen Young? To say, I have everything going on in my life. Is God truly the most high? Or is it still my work? Is it still my family and my children and hobbies? Is it truly, is he truly the most high God? Or is it El Shaddai, God Almighty? I've got some problems that I can't handle. Do we trust God to fulfill that? We're struggling with finances going, Lord, how are we going to make this happen? He's like, are you serious? I'm right here with you. I've got a cattle on a thousand hills. Do you think are you're going to go hungry? The Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh. We have to believe that. We have to hunger for that, don't we? That God is going to provide for us. But if we keep stepping in and grabbing the reins, it's not going to happen. I learned this firsthand coming out of college. I made the decision while some of my roommates were going off to uh, graduate school or going off to start their careers, I decided to go be a missionary. I had talked with a man named Stanley Shipp who was planning churches up in the Northeast, trying to get young college students to go and, and to set up churches where there weren't any. And so the plan was for our team to go up to Connecticut and, and to be the fourth church that was planted over a six-year period. And so I agreed to do this. And so you go through a, a year-long training to be a vocational missionary. And, and the first part of the training is four months that we'd spend going around the world to learn about world religions and also to just get us ready for what we're going to be experiencing in St. Louis. Well, I had to raise $1,000 in monthly support, but I also had to raise 7500 for this world tour and looking today, I mean, that was quite a bargain even back then. But when I first started sending out uh, letters for support from friends and family members from the congregation where I grew up, uh, boy, it wasn't hard. Money started pouring in. And why not? Because I'm a missionary. I deserve this, you know? And so money started coming in. And guess what? Within about a month and a half, my monthly support was taken care of for the next 12 to 18 months of the time I was going to be spending in there. I was pretty excited. And most of my money from our world tour had come in. But I got within a week of my go no go time, and I'd raised about 5000 still lacked 2500 to go on this trip. And the checks dried up. The che checks stopped coming in. And I put in a few phone calls to some folks, but uh, nothing else came in. I was still 2500 short. 
And that summer, I was working over in Denton, about 45 minutes away from Dallas, at a church there as a youth intern. And at, at the time, I decided, I'm going to take a night. And so after church on Wednesday night, and I went over to my parents' house, and I kind of laid some stuff out for them. And I said, okay, next Tuesday, I've got to have all my money together. Well, how short are you? Well, 2500 And I, I fully expected my dad's next statement to say, well, who do I make the check out to? And he just said, wow, I really hope you get that money. And I'm, well, that's why I'm here. And he goes, well, you don't understand. We still got your sister in college. We're paying student loans. And we told you after graduation, you'd be on your own. And, well, we, we kind of meant that. And, boy, but he, he left me with this. He said, if this is of God and he wants it to happen, you're, you'll have the funds that you need. And can you take the trash out as you're going? So, okay. Thanks, Mom and Ed, you know. But on the Friday before the money was due, I took the day off, and I was there in the house that they provided behind the church. And so I was staying there just by myself, and I fasted, and I prayed, and I got down on my knees, and I wept. And I spent some time in God's Word, and I got down on my knees, and I wept some more like I had never gone before God before. And I realized the Lord wanted me to seek Him. Up to this point, it had been done under my power. Been done under my connections. And that's not what God wanted. So I felt like I had humbled myself sufficiently and petitioned the Lord. And I I kept waiting for a phone call. Hey, you know, it it didn't come. Saturday, nothing rolled around. I hadn't told anyone at the church in Denton. I didn't want to be, you know, an imposition. Sunday, nothing. Monday morning, I got a phone call about 10 o'clock from a lady named Miss Arnwine there at the church at Singing Elks in Denton. And she called me up. She said, you don't know me, but I want to have lunch with you. I said, okay. And so she goes, why don't you meet me at Black Eyed Pea? And so I went and had lunch with her. And she explained to me that her father had recently passed away, and he was a big fan of Stanley. And Stanley had, had come and spoken into his life at a time where he was very down. And he believed not only in Stanley as, as a minister and evangelist, but also in what he was trying to do in raising up other evangelists. She said, we want to use a portion of his estate to bless what Stanley's been trying to do. Would you be willing to accept a, a check to help out with that? And I'm like, yeah, but I probably could. You know? And so she passed the check across the table, and I didn't open it up or anything. I just tucked it in and said, thank you. So I got back to my office and opened it up, and it was $1,500. And my first thought was, Lord, I said 25 you know. <laughs> so it was really kind of confusing because I'd asked for a clear sign. And I'm like, Lord, this is still kind of, I'm over halfway. Appreciate it. What am I going to do here? And so I actually thought, well, maybe I could quickly get a credit card and then go run up a bat. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. That's once again of me. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So I got home that day, and there was some mail, and my sister had sent me a letter. And she, she told me, she said, I've been working all summer, so I wouldn't have to work this fall when I go to school. She said, uh, I have saved up about $2,000 for my spending money. She said, I want to give you my spending money for the fall, and I'll work because I believe in what you're trying to do. And there's a check for $1,000. I'm, I'm not trying to preach health and wealth gospel. I'm simply trying to illustrate that that was the point in my life where I was broken. And during that time of brokenness, the Lord intervened and said, I am Jehovah Jireh. I am the one that will provide if you'll just ask me. I have to tell you that Isaacs from above are so much more grateful and gratifying than the Ishmaels of my own doing. The last point for you this morning is that this lesson is for everyone in this room. Whatever stage of life, whatever stage of faith you're in, the Lord is calling you to yield. If God's still testing Abraham at 137, he's still got work to do on each of us. Amen? He wants to put you in positions where you'll have to trust in him it may be a situation beyond your control but you've been trying to control he wants you to yield god is calling each of us to personal brokenness 
He's calling us to, to admit our dependence upon him with ever increasing glory. As we head into our time of communion, a lot of people look at the story of Abraham and his son Isaac up on Mount Moriah as kind of an archetype. It's kind of a, a, a story that, that will lead us to think about what Jesus did. And there's a lot of similarities. In fact, Mount Moriah would eventually be the eventual spot for Jerusalem. So all this took place within this area. For three days, you have the child of promise is being led up. And for three days, the father worried about him. For three days, Jesus was in the tomb. Uh, Isaac even goes and, and carries the wood with him, just as Jesus carried his cross. But there's a difference in this story. A difference comes in that Isaac was bound, whereas Jesus went in the night in the garden and said, not my will, Lord, but yours be done, to show us of anyone that could claim the right to lead his own life, it'd be Jesus Christ. But he says, I want to release that. I want my body to be broken, not for my glory, but for yours, Lord, and for the people that I'm allowing myself to be sacrificed for. Let's commune together. Dear Lord, we acknowledge you as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end. It's in you, Lord, that we move, that we breathe, and we have our being. Lord, we believe that you are the author, the perfecter of all creation. Lord, we say these things with our lips. Forgive us when our actions tell us otherwise. Break us down. Break us of the power of sin in our lives so that we can truly and freely run with you. Lord, help us to yield to your direction in our lives. Lord, as we partake of this bread that represents the body of your son, Jesus, Lord, we know that we do not deserve the sacrifice of substitutional atonement that your son gave in our stead. Lord, help us not only to remember the sacrifice, but Lord, help us to be transformed with that sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen.